Good morning. Uh, welcome to another lecture uh, from Link Data and the Semantic Web. Today, uh, we'll continue with uh, the overview of the most used vocabularies um, on the web of, uh, of data. Uh, and we'll talk uh, about, in the first part, we'll talk about uh, good patients, which is a vocabulary for e-commerce. So if you are building an e-shop, that is the vocabulary you would, uh, you would like to use. And uh, then I'll briefly talk about schema.org, which we have already seen um, in the lecture about embedding um, data into web pages. And uh, after that, uh, I'll continue with the uh, introduction to OWL, which is uh, a more complex uh, way of uh, defining ontologies, vocabularies. Uh, we've talked about RDFS, uh, which you can use to, to define your own classes and predicates. And uh, OWL gives you uh, more tools to, to do the same uh, in a more complex way. Uh, and I'll show you um, in the second uh, part of the lecture. Right. So uh, we'll start with good relations. Uh, it is uh, now quite an uh, old vocabulary. It's from 2011, which means uh, 10 years old. Um, but uh, it still serves as a base for describing uh, predicates and classes used by e-shops to describe what they are selling, what they are buying, for instance. Uh, uh, well, and uh, it is based on a simple principle, uh, which we will talk about uh, in a moment. Um, one of uh, the interesting features of good relations is that it is syntax neutral, which means it defines the properties and the classes, but you can use the same properties and same classes with many different syntaxes and data models. So you can use good relations with uh, microdata, RDFA, embedding in web pages. Uh, you can use um, good relations in uh, RDF, which is standalone, completely independent of web pages. Uh, and so on. So it just gives you a couple of uh, properties and classes to use, and it is up to you um, in which syntaxes or data models you use those. Of course, um, when you publish your data like this, uh, you need also to have the applications that expect the data in that uh, particular syntax. So that's the other side uh, of, uh, of the syntax neutrality which means that it allows you to create data in many different syntaxes, and it is not entirely clear which of those syntaxes are supported by which applications uh, in the end. We'll talk about relations in RDF uh, because um, that is what we are talking about the whole semester. Right, uh, good relations has the GR prefix. So in the linked open vocabularies, you can see that it is one of the most prominent ones and one of the most reused ones. Um, and uh, this is the uh, overview of the vocabulary. It might seem a little bit uh, complex, uh, but again, uh, we'll take a closer look and you'll see that there are a couple of core classes and core attributes and um, the rest is um, more or less um, simple uh, connective of those uh, core classes and properties. So the basic principle that the good relations is built on is called the agent promise um, object principle, which basically splits the domain of e-commerce uh, into three or four uh, core classes. So when we are talking about e-commerce, we need to be talking about um, the business entities, the companies that are doing something buying something, selling something, uh, having um, e-shops and uh, having uh, regular <laughs> locations in which they sell stuff. So those are the uh, business entities. Then of course, um, there need to be the services and products that uh, they sell or offer. Um, so again, we need a couple of uh, values and classes um, to be able to describe what is being sold, what is being bought, and some basic properties. Uh, 
Then the promise path um, or modeled using the good relations offering class uh, connects the business entities and products or services using uh, the business function. So the offering basically describes whether the business entity is buying some, something, offering something, selling something, because um, what is being done to that thing, for instance, uh, I don't know, a camera, we'll have an example of a camera. So uh, let's say we are buying a camera or selling a camera. So uh, the fact that we are buying or selling it is independent of the properties of the camera and it is independent of the business entity which uh, buys or sells the thing. So we describe the business entity separate, then the products and services also separate, and then the business function, the offering is also a separate description saying that this product or service is being bought or sold uh, for some price and so on. Um, so we'll see uh, uh, some concrete examples in, in a moment, but that's the third building block. And the fourth, fourth one um, is the location, which is the actual shop somewhere with its address and contact information belonging to a business entity. And uh, it is the location of where some services are being offered or some products are being sold and so on. So this, uh, these are the core classes of good relations and uh, everything will revolve around, around these. Uh, we'll start with the business entity. There is, there is nothing really to it. Um, we have a thing which is a good relations business entity and it has a legal name. Now this is a, uh, this is a new predicate in good relations because uh, legal name implies that this name is actually registered in some business registry of, or something. Uh, in the Czech Republic, we have such a business registry where each company has its uh, legal name. So this is the legal name, which might be different from um, sort of the business label that they use uh, for commerce. So this is uh, the legal name. And the rest is something we have already seen. Uh, fourth page links to the home page, and uh, this is a subset of the properties that you may use, but it is nothing specific to good relations. So you may say that the company has an address, a telephone, an email. And these are from the schema.org vocabulary, uh, hence the prefix s. And uh, one interesting thing you might notice here is that uh, we have already seen how telephone numbers and email addresses should be represented in RDF. And uh, I was always saying that uh, those should be represented as IRIs in the tell or mail to schema, right? Uh, and uh, here we can see that the telephone numbers and uh, the email address is a plain literal of a type string uh, because no data type is, uh, is given here. And um, it is a fact that uh, in schema.org, uh, many values that would normally be typed in RDF are actually not typed. And uh, the parsing of those values is then made a little more difficult for the end user. But I will talk about those uh, design decisions of schema.org later. This is just something you might be wondering about um, why the telephone numbers and email addresses here are suddenly strings and not IRIs. So that's uh, how it is done using schema.org. So this is something schema.org specific, basically. Um, right. So the next uh, core class is uh, the location. Uh, the location represents uh, a shop on the street somewhere. And uh, again, we know it's a location. It has a name. And again, address, geo coordinates, telephone. All these are not really specific to good relations. Um, so you may want to, you might want to describe the location by any means you want to. Uh, the important part for good relations is that it is marked as a location. So now we know how to describe business entities and locations. Uh, and uh, one uh, particular thing uh, I will talk about in uh, more detail is the opening hours specification of a location because this 
shows an interesting again pattern that uh, you might use to describe some things on uh, on the web using RDF, and uh, this is specific to opening hours, which again uh, is quite common thing, and it might not be quite straightforward. Um, to know how to properly represent such a thing as uh, opening our specification. Uh, let's say that uh, a shop is open um, in the morning on uh, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and in the evening on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but also in the evening uh, and uh, a different time interval on Monday and on Friday and so on. Uh, and then it might be a special opening hour specification for uh, for Sunday and Saturday. And now suddenly you have quite a complex structure you need to somehow represent in RDF. And uh, this is one of the possible ways of, of doing that. So according to good relations, the opening hour specification actually is a um, set of specifications. And um, here we have an example where we have a set of two specifications and um, they together describe the whole uh, opening hour specification. And uh, each one is um, a separate opening hour specification, which is defined by the opening and closing time. So uh, here we have um, the specification saying that the shop is open from 8 to 12 on these days. And there is a list of days uh, during which the shop is open in this particular time interval. So if you want to say that the shop is also open in another time interval, perhaps uh, during other days of the week, uh, you need to create another specification for, for that other time interval and with another list of days of week. So this is how the opening hour specification is modeled according to good relations. So the primary identifier is the time interval. If you have multiple time intervals, you need multiple specifications. And then this interval is applied to days of, uh, of the week. Right, so that was the location. Now the third part of uh, the third core part of good relations is the offering. Um, and with the offering goes the price specification, but let's focus on the offering first. So the offering actually connects uh, <clears throat> connects a product to uh, the to the business entity, but we'll connect those core classes later. Now let's focus just on the offering. So the offering has a name and description, as almost everything has uh, in the world of uh, of uh, data on the web. Also, according to the label, everything link data principle. Uh, and uh, then we have an uh, indication that uh, this offering has the cell business, business function, which means something is being sold. Then there is uh, some additional properties like condition, EN code, and uh, some other code, um, and identifier, and so on. And there is a page for the offering and uh, an image. Uh, so those, there are many more uh, properties that you can use with an offering. This is just an example. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the more interesting part is the price specification here, which again has or shows a modeling pattern that we have already seen. Uh, we have played with the data set of the check actions of the Czech Trade Inspection Authority. And uh, there were businesses who uh, or which got fined for something, right? Based on the check performed there. And uh, the fine there was structured according to uh, good relations. So we have actually seen this one before. So the price specification here is again a structured, uh, or oh, it, it is a thing, it is a resource uh, which has a type. So you, uh, we have already seen a unit price, uh, we have already seen price specification. In this case, it is more specific because it's a unit price specification, which means it is a price per unit. And here we have the split of uh, the, uh, the value into currency, uh, the actual value. So the value is a number, the currency here is a string. And uh, there might be other properties like this price is valid through and uh, date time uh, until which the price is valid. Uh, 
<clears throat> also, there could be the indication of what is actually the unit here, because it is a unit price. So you might also want to indicate what is the unit. Is it a liter or kilogram or a piece or something like that? Um, the important takeaway from this is that in linked data, price is never a single literal combining all this as a text. It is a structured value because it has many parts. Um, and then uh, we have uh, some uh, quantitative values here, but we'll get to those a little bit later. But you might notice that there is the uh, rating of the offering. Uh, it is actually a little bit interesting, the rating here, because um, combined with the fact that uh, good relations and schema.org is used for um, machine readable data embedded in web pages of eShops. Uh, it is interesting to know that actually, when you see this star rating in Google, when you search for something, for some products, and directly in the Google search uh, results, you can see that some product has a five star rating or a four star rating. It is not something that Google would calculate. It is actually just based on the data found in the web page, which is put there by the publisher of the web page. So, yeah, uh, there might be a trust issue a little bit with the star rating in the Google search results because it is just a display of what the publisher put there. It doesn't have to be based on truth. Um, and this is the data structure for it. So there's a number, review count, and uh, that is exactly what is then being shown in Google search results. Right. Uh, so now uh, we have talked about the business entity, we have talked about the location, we have talked about um, the offering. So what is left uh, is to describe the product or the service being offered or being sold. And there are three basic subtypes uh, of a product or service according to good relations. The first one is uh, quite a straightforward one. So this one is good relations individual which means that you are describing a, a particular thing. So you have a, a laptop like uh, this one, and you are describing this particular laptop uh, that you want to buy it or you, you are selling it. Uh, so that's the individual. Uh, a property of that um, is that uh, you can only buy it or sell it once because it is the specific one thing. Um, um, yeah, when talking about cars, that particular car would have a mileage and, uh, and a VIN identifier because it is that particular car. Uh, on the contrary, you can describe a product or service model, which means that you have many of the same type of thing uh, on, uh, in stock and you are describing the model uh, and everything you say about the model applies to all the individuals uh, which are of this uh, of this model. So let's say iPod Nano 16 gigabytes. Well, uh, everything you say about that product or service model applies to all the individual instances, uh, but you don't list them here. So you can say that, uh, and you can sell this and buy many times, depending on how many actual items are in stock. And and the third type here is something in the middle. So uh, the class is some items, and it is kind of a black box, a set of uh, some uh, items. Uh, and uh, the difference from a product or service model here is that uh, with the product or service model, everything you say about it applies to all the instances uh, or all the, all the things of this model. With some items, this is not the case. So some items is a group of items, you might want to say something about that group of items, but it doesn't mean that all the statements you say about this group of items applies to each member of that group. So um, yeah, it's not a list of individuals. It is also not a product or service model because some statements may be about one subset of the items and other statements might be about other uh, subset of those items. So it is a little bit fuzzy, this one. So those are the basic three subtypes of products or services 
uh, in good relation. So let's have an example. And here we'll have a Volkswagen Beetle, uh, a car. It is uh, an individual, which means that we can say that this one is unique because it's been owned by Madonna. Uh, so we know it's the one, not a, a product or service model. Then we can have a product or service model with its EN code and the description and name, maybe some dimensions here. Um, and we know that all those statements apply to all the items being sold or bought. And an example of some items. So here we all have some cameras. We'll have a depiction of one of those. It doesn't mean that all of them look the same way. For instance, um, this may be, might be a secondhand e-shop. They have a couple of, uh, couple of cameras of this type, but each one may be in a different condition and they depict just one of those. So uh, they say it's some items and not a product or service model. Right, so those were the four basic core classes of good relations. What is left is to connect all of those uh, so that we have a proper data set describing the whole eShop. So we'll have a business entity and uh, we'll have the GR offers predicate connecting the business entity to the offerings. Then we'll have the offering and the offering will be a product and the product will be a product or service. And uh, we'll have a business entity, which has a point of sales, POS, pointing to a location. So this is how all those um, classes can be interconnected. So we'll have business entity pointing to offerings, pointing to points of sales, and we'll have um, offerings, including products. And the offerings are being offered by the business entity. Now, uh, we might have seen uh, another structured, uh, structured value uh, in the examples. Um, whenever we have uh, a value which has a unit and the actual numeric value, it needs to be structured in RDF. We have seen this with uh, prices, but that's the same thing. In prices, the units are the currencies. So we can abstract from that and have a generic quantitative value. Quantitative means it has a number and some unit. So here, quantitative value means simply that we'll have a number and a unit and we need to structure that value. So when we are talking about weight, uh, we'll have um, the, the value will not be a literal. It will not be simply a number. It will be a whole thing in this case, a blank node of a type quantitative value, and it will have the has value predicate pointing to the actual number. And then it will have the um, has unit of measurement stating the unit. Now, the same goes for voltage here. This is some electric anvil, so it has a voltage. And then again, voltage is a quantitative value, but in this case, it is uh, not a single value, it's an interval. So it has a minimum value, maximum, maximum value, and again, units of measure. Now, one a little bit weird thing from uh, the link data point of view is that those units are actually literals. So this defies a little bit the link not label principle because uh, for instance, kilograms here will be represent, represented by the KGM uh, literal and not by a thing which would have the KGM label and uh, maybe some other properties. Um, this is kind of for historical reasons, because as I mentioned, the good relations vocabulary is quite old. And at that time, uh, there were not many code lists represented as linked data. So what they did was that uh, they at least standardized the content of those literals. Uh, according to this document. Uh, if you click on this, you'll see an Excel file uh, with uh, codes for um, common units. So for meters, meters squared, uh, kilograms, kilograms per meter squared, and for, uh, for uh, pieces, which means no unit. Um, this document actually defines those um, codes. 
So those, those are codes for those uh, units. So those codes are recommended to be used whenever you model your uh, quantitative value according to good relations. Um, maybe in the future, um, they will convert this code list into actual linked data code list, giving um, those units IRIs, not just codes, but uh, that is still not done, unfortunately. However, it is quite an official list of codes for units because it's uh, published by the United Nations. So uh, it is uh, one of the possibilities to be, to be used. Now, not every value is actually a quantitative value. So not every value in e-commerce has a number and units. Uh, an example of such non quantitative value, which is called a qualitative value in good relations. So an example is a garment size. So when you are going to buy, a, uh, going to, uh, to, to a store to buy a t-shirt, uh, the size will typically be medium, large, small, and so on, which are not numbers. Uh, and uh, there is, again, a design pattern in good relations on how to approach uh, modeling those kinds of values. And um, basically, um, you create a class. Here, um, they use OWL class, but uh, because we have not um, talked about OWL yet, we'll do that in the second part of the lecture. You can imagine RDFS class here. It, it will work the same. So you'll create a class um, for your, let's say, garment sizes or other, uh, other values. You will label it, and you'll say that it is a subclass of qualitative value, saying this is my class, my new qualitative value. Then uh, you will create instances of the individual values. So for medium, large, you say medium is a garment size, large is also a garment size. You will in include the label. And then good relations provides you with predicates, uh, which allow you to say which value is greater or lesser than uh, another value. So you can say that medium is lesser than large and large is greater than medium. So like this, you can basically create a list of your qualitative values. Then uh, good relations also says, create a property connecting the product or service to that, uh, to that value. So you'll create a object property again here. We haven't talked about uh, object and uh, data type properties yet in our, but you can imagine RDF property here. It will work the same. So we'll create also a property, which is a sub property of qualitative product or service property. Uh, and the range will be your newly created uh, class. And then you'll have a t-shirt, which is a individual product or service model or some items. Uh, instance with its name and uh, some other properties. And you will use your created property with your created value. And applications, uh, understanding of supporting good relations should be able, thanks to those connections, uh, sub property of and subclass of here, they should, uh, should be able to, to use those lesser and greater predicates, for instance, in user interfaces. So this is a design approach to uh, qualitative values. Now, if we take a look at the overview uh, of good relations again, we'll see that we have already covered most of it. So there is the offering, the business entity, the price specification, and product or service here. And there is individual, some items, uh, quantitative value, qualitative value, and so on. Uh, days of, of the week, opening our specification location. So most of those we have, uh, we have covered and the rest are uh, not that interesting parts like uh, delivery lead time and so on. So if uh, you'll ever be in a situation when, uh, where you will model uh, data for an e-shop, uh, this is one of the ways to go. Now, uh, we'll continue with schema.org. Um, so schema.org is a vocabulary. It is quite generic. It contains many different types of things, specifically uh, in, uh, well, I, I think a year ago, it contained 841 types. 
and 1,400 properties and so on. Of course, we won't talk about all of those, but there is a documentation at the schema.org address, and you can see an overview, and there is also a full list of types and so on. And so, um, yeah, it is quite a generic vocabulary containing descriptions of many things. Uh, you might use schema.org whenever you do not find uh, or when you're thinking about how to cover your data with vocabularies to be published on the web. Um, the way you go about it is basically you go to linked open vocabularies, you search for existing vocabularies. When you do not find one, then you go to schema.org because it is probable that some parts of uh, the data you have is covered by something in schema.org. And if you do not find something in schema.org, then you create your own vocabulary. Uh, however, uh, schema.org is created by uh, the big technology companies such as Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, and so on. Um, it is created to serve the, the, their purposes and their purposes is to make it easier for them to extract machine readable data from web pages. That's the, that's the primary focus of schema.org. Um, it might seem uh, like a good idea to have everything in one place, schema.org, and you will see that schema.org covers uh, things like organizations and persons. We have seen false vocabulary for those. You will see that uh, they have um, place, uh, product, offering, um, review and so on. We have seen that in good relations. And actually the way schema.org um, went about it was that uh, they found false and said, hmm, we would like that. Let's take all the classes and properties from false and import it into schema.org. Then they saw good relations and uh, they said, hmm, that's something we would like to use. So let's take all the properties and classes from good relations and import them into schema.org. Um, and they did that for uh, many different vocabularies. And then uh, they uh, put schema.org on GitHub and started um, to receive community contributions and started um, evolving uh, independently. And gradually um, those, uh, those companies with their search engines are uh, pushing more and more the usage of schema.org instead of the original uh, vocabulary. So first, Google search was uh, actually supporting uh, uh, good relations. So if you had a good relations markup in RDFA, let's say in your web page, then uh, that showed in your uh, Google uh, search results. And then they imported it in schema.org. And now the recommendation is to use schema.org and not good relations, even though the modeling patterns are the same and um, the classes and properties were just taken and imported into schema.org. I personally do not like that uh, approach very much because schema.org um, took um, a little bit different approach to modeling data and I will illustrate. So, I talked about the uh, quantitative values, how they should be structured and how in good relations, this is done in a good way because you have support for intervals and unit prices and so on. Then in 2012, when schema.org got imported, uh, good relations got imported into schema.org, um, you could find a recommendation to actually take a step back and uh, Whenever you have a product, it will just have a set of features like this. And uh, each feature will have a name, a value, and uh, maybe some unit text, and that's it. No data types, uh, no standardization according to United Nations. No, uh, or, uh, in addition, they, they basically encourage you to have structured values in your literals and so on. The effect here is, or, or the reason why they did this was that uh, they said uh, it is too hard for the web page publishers or the data publishers uh, to actually structure the data in the way that good relations required. It is too hard on them. And uh, thanks to that, we have not enough structured data in the web pages. So let's make it easier on the web page publishers. 
and allow them to have um, uh, all the properties not so structured this way. So it will have a generic feature with uh, some text and some value with no particular structure and so on. Well, the effect here is that for big companies like Google and Microsoft, it is still easy to take all this messy data and clean it and extract the machine readable information from that. But for smaller companies or individuals, it is harder because the data is messy, it is not as structured, and it is harder to work with. So this is the reason why I don't like this approach, because uh, basically it makes it um, easier to use the data for big companies and harder to use the data for everyone else, which is uh, not a nice approach, I think. So that's why I always prefer to structure the data properly. And that's why I still talk about the original good relations vocabulary, because there uh, the modeling was done in a nice way. Um, and uh, I always prefer standardization on the side of the publishers so that the data is then easily used by the users. Right, uh, and talking about schema.org, uh, by the way, you can take a look at schema.org uh, if you wish and see what's in there. Um, it is not always bad, uh, but you'll see that uh, they don't use RDF data types. They um, use their own um, uh, syntax for some structured values and so on. So not really RDF compliant, uh, even though the data is in RDF. Uh, but talking about schema.org, this is one of the ways of embedding uh, machine readable data into a web page. You represent the data using schema.org in JSON-LD and embed it in a web page using a script element. So uh, if you take a look at, uh, at uh, this particular eShop or maybe some other eShop and uh, you open up the page source, you will see a JSON-LD snippet using schema.org in there because that is what Google and Bing and other search engines then parse and used to show better search results. Right, so this was the part about uh, good relations and schema.org. Uh, any questions? Right, so uh, actually the first vocabulary that I told you about was RDFS, RDF schema, which was used to create other vocabularies in a very simple way. It allowed you to create your own classes. It allowed you to create your own predicates. And then it allowed you to create hierarchies of classes and hierarchies of predicates. And that was it. Uh, so a very simple tool to build your own vocabulary. Uh, but there is a stronger tool called OWL. OWL is a short for a web ontology language which is uh, kind of interesting because it is in uh, another order than the actual label, uh, but OWL just is a cooler, uh, cooler acronym. So it's called OWL. It is already in its second version uh, from 2012. And basically it is an ontology to create other ontologies or a vocabulary to create ontologies. Uh, and um, it has, uh, it is, a little bit syntax independent. It has its own syntax. It has an XML syntax. It has an RDF syntax. We'll of course talk about the RDF syntax here. Uh, but before we get to OWL, we need to talk about the open world assumption. This is an assumption that we actually work with in uh, the world of linked data all the time, but uh, we haven't explicitly talked about it yet. And uh, in OWL, it is especially important. Uh, and um, the open world assumption is an assumption about a truth value of a statement. So when we make a statement, and this might be an RDF statement in data, but it might be any statement, um, using the open world assumption, uh, we say that uh, we don't know whether, uh, or we say that <laughs> the truth value of the statement may be true, um, independent of whether this is actually in the data or not. Um, maybe it will be better shown on, a, on, on the example. So we have a statement, Mary is a citizen of France. So a simple statement might also be an RDF statement. Now, we have a question, is Paul a citizen of France? So if you would have a, a relational database 
of citizens of France. And uh, you would have uh, Mary in the table of citizens of France. And uh, you won't, you will not have Paul there. You will probably say that Paul is not a citizen of France because uh, he's not listed in the list of citizens of France. So that's the typical coast world uh, point of view. But actually, the open world point of view is that we do not know whether Paul is a citizen of France because we don't have any data about Paul. We have only data about Mary. And we know that Mary is a citizen of France. We don't have any data about Paul, so we do not know whether Paul is a citizen of France. Um, this actually uh, is uh, commonly interpreted wrong in the, uh, in the world of linked data. So whenever you are working with RDF and you are missing some uh, statement, you should always think about the open world assumption. And uh, based on that, you should know that if you do not have a statement in your data, it doesn't mean that the statement does not hold. So yeah, it, it means nothing. It just means that you don't, do not know anything about the statement. It doesn't imply that uh, the statement is false. Um, and if you work with your data in that way, you need to know and state that you are working with the closed world assumption. Meaning that if you are missing some data, it means that it's not true. But that's not the case on the web. So that's the open world assumption. Right, so let's now introduce some basic building blocks of, uh, of OWL. So in OWL, we'll, we'll call individuals uh, the resources of or, or things. So the resources or things that we already know are called individuals in OWL. Uh, this actually comes from uh, logic. So if you took a logic course, uh, you will feel right at home. Um, so here, Marcus is a thing has its own IRI, and it is called an individual in OWL. Um, then we'll have classes. So also in OWL, they are called classes. And we'll have properties, which are predicates that we already know. So we'll have individuals, things, uh, classes, and uh, we'll have properties connecting to individuals. So every property connects to two individuals. Now, we will talk about a function called an interpretation. Interpretation takes an IRI as an argument. And uh, when this IRI identifies an individual, um, the value of that function is that individual. So this might be a little hard to imagine, but if this notebook would have um, an IRI, then when I take this IRI and apply the interpretation, I, the value is the thing itself. So uh, you can uh, imagine it like that. So if you have an IRI of a person, the value is that person. If you have an IRI of a class, the value is the set of all uh, members of that class. And if the interpretation, the IRI is a predicate, then uh, the value of the function is the set of all pairs of things connected by that predicate. This is something uh, I already kind of shown you when we talked about RDFS, but in OWL, this is really, really useful to, uh, to, to think about uh, the individuals, the classes, and the relations um, or properties in this way. So uh, an individual is the specific thing. The class is the set of all things of the type. And the relations are, is, um, or the property is the set of all pairs of things connected by that property. And uh, yeah, we'll have um, uh, some other building blocks of our, one of those is class memberships. So in RDF, we say that an individual is of a type and uh, an IRI of a class. And we, uh, using the interpretation, we, uh, mean that the interpretation of the individual, which is the actual thing, uh, belongs to the set of all things of that type, 
which is the interpretation of the IRI of the class. So we can we can uh, look at it graphically. So this uh, this one, Nicholas, um, is a member of the set of all males, and the set of all males is the value of the interpretation of X male, which is an IRI, and X Nicholas has the interpretation this one, the, the person. And uh, yeah, we use RDF type. To, to say that Nicholas belongs to this, uh, to this class. So it is actually not new. You already know this from RDFS, but it is another point of view on the same thing. Then when we have properties, we say that one individual uh, is connected by a property to another individual in RDF. And uh, using interpretation, it means that uh, the one person and the other person, the pair of the two people, belongs to the set of all pairs of individuals connected by this particular property. So Carla, uh, which is the, uh, who is the value of uh, interpretation of this IRI. So this entire expression represents Carla. This entire expression represents Nicholas. And uh, the pair, Carla and Nicholas, uh, belongs to the set of all pairs uh, of married people. So here we have again Carla, Nicholas, and this is the set of pairs of all married people, married to. Still clear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So now we may uh, move forward to some more um, interesting relations. So here we have the subclass of which we already know. So we say that uh, one class is a subclass of another class when uh, the set of all, um, all things, right? The, 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 yeah, the set of all things of this type is the subset of the set of all things of the other type. So um, president is a class of, uh, which is a set of all presidents and politician is again a class and it is a set of all politicians. And clearly, presidents are subclass of politicians. So this goes back uh, to, uh, to the first class of uh, elementary school when we had fruit and apples and pears, right? So this is the same thing, only written in RDF and uh, using interpretation. So here we have politicians and presidents. So presidents are subclass of politicians. Um, right. Then uh, subproperty of. We already know this example from RDFS and that uh, sub property of creates the hierarchy of predicates. And again, uh, now that we know that an interpretation of a, an IRI of a predicate is actually the set of all pairs of things connected by that predicate, it is quite clear that um, in our example, when we have the primary driver, which is the set of all things connected by primary driver. This set of pairs is a subset of uh, a larger set of pairs um, called driver, uh, connecting all individuals using the driver predicate. So when I have a, a person here and a car here, and I know that the person is a primary driver of, I also know that the person is a driver of this car because primary driver is a subproperty of driver. And this is a set of all pairs of person and driver uh, and, and car called primary driver. And driver is also a set of pairs of person and a car, but the larger one, because the driver doesn't have to be a primary driver here. So again, uh, this is the set perspective on uh, predicates in RDFS. Um, yeah. Now, to be able to work with OWL a little bit better, we also need to define uh, the top and the bottom uh, constructs here. So we'll have a class OWL thing, and we'll say that this class contains everything. So everything is a member of OWL thing, and there will be a syntactic shortcut. So uh, this is everything. <laughs> this is a symbol of everything. So interpretation of OWL thing uh, is uh, really everything. 
The opposite is our nothing. So that's an empty set because nothing is member of our nothing. It's an empty class. And we'll have the same for properties. So this is for classes and we'll have the same for properties. So we'll have a top property and we'll say that every pair of individuals is connected by a, a top property. So regardless of what those two individuals are, they are always connected by the top property. On the other hand, we'll have, have a bottom property uh, saying that no two individuals, no two things are connected by the bottom property. And we'll use those to actually define other constructs in OWL. So now uh, in OWL, and this is something new, we can create a class uh, by saying that this new class is an intersection of other classes. This is, that's something we couldn't express in RDFS, but we can express it in OWL. So here we'll have uh, a class represented by uh, an intersection of multiple other classes. And uh, when we take a look at the uh, interpretation of this, it's quite straightforward. So the interpretation of an intersection of uh, those class I arise is the actual intersection of the sets represented by those I arise. So if we define a class as intersection of actor and politician, we will have uh, actors here as the yellow set and politicians as the red set. And the intersection here, which is the orange set, is uh, the value of the interpretation of, of this definition, the intersection of two classes. And now we might, uh, we, we are able to say that something is a member of this intersection, or we might uh, be able to ask if it is true that some individual is actually a member of this intersection based on what we know in our knowledge base. So this is the definition of intersection. <clears throat> then we'll have, of course, the union. So uh, this is the same. We have a union uh, of um, IRIs of classes. And the interpretation of this union is uh, the union of the interpretations of the individual classes. And we have, again, actors and politicians. And the union is the whole thing here. So those five people are members of the union of actor and politician. So again, set uh, basic stuff from elementary school. And uh, when we have an uh, intersection and a union, we we'll also have a complement. So uh, that um, the definition is complement of some class. And it means that it is everything but the, the class. Um, so again, quite straightforward. And uh, here uh, it comes with a warning because of the definition of everything, which is really everything. Uh, when we say that um, we want to work with a class defined as complement of politician, it is really everything but politicians. And by everything, it means um, animals, fish, other people, chairs, furniture, electronics, and so on, everything just not those individuals in that set. Um, this is a source of uh, common errors because someone may assume that the complement of politician is people who are not politicians, but that's not true. Complement of politician is everything, just not politician. Right, <clears throat> and uh, there are some other constructs uh, that we might use to define new classes. Um, there is uh, existential property uh, construct that we may use. So here, um, the definition looks like this in OWL. It is a class which is a restriction uh, on property and there is a property IRI and uh, it says that on this property, there needs to be some values from a part particular class. So that's the existential property saying that uh, it is a class of all things which have a property and some of the values on that property are from a particular class. Um, here is a specific example. We will define a class of things which on property parent of have some values from the class male. In, in plain English, it means we are looking for things or 
people in this case um, have, uh, being parents of some males. Uh, and on the example of uh, the Simpsons, we have uh, uh, we have the interpretation of uh, of uh, the class male, which is this black, uh, well, almost rectangle. Then we have the interpretation of the parent of uh, predicate, which are the pairs of uh, um, well individuals saying that Homer is a parent of uh, Maggie, Lisa, and Bart, and Flanders is a parent of uh, those two uh, two boys. Now, the class uh, here um, represents those individuals that have some males connected to them using the parent of property. So both Homer, because he, has, he is parent of Bart and Bart is male, and Flanders, because he is a parent of those two boys. So both of those are actually members of, of this class. So this, again, is something we wouldn't be able to define just using RDFS, and we need our, uh, to define classes like these. Where there is existential property, there is also a universal property restriction. And uh, here, we want to say that uh, we want to define a class of people or, or things, uh, which on some property have only values from uh, a particular class. So on, on this example, again, of the Simpsons, uh, we want those individuals who on property parent of have only values from the class male. So people who are parents of males only. And uh, this excludes Homer because Homer is a parent of uh, Lisa and Maggie. Um, they are not males. So Homer doesn't have all the values on parent of from the male class and is therefore not member of this newly uh, created class. Flanders quite naturally is a member of this class because he is a father of two boys. But maybe surprisingly, all the kids are also members of this class because um, they have no parent of property, which means that all the values, which are none, are from the male class. So they are also members of, of this class. Right. So those are some a little bit more advanced ways of uh, how you can uh, define your classes using OWL. Um, this is just an introduction. OWL is uh, much more complex, uh, but that's out of the scope of this course. This should be just an introduction. So there is some syntactic sugar. For instance, we might want to say that one class is disjoint with another class, which is nothing else than saying that the intersection of those classes is subclass of nothing, which is another way of saying that it is empty because all subclasses of an empty set are empty sets. So an intersection of those classes is empty means that those classes are disjoint. Then uh, the definitions that uh, we know from RDFS, the domain and range definitions, saying that values from uh, uh, the values of a certain predicate are from a certain class or instances of a certain class. Um, so those are again syntactic sugar shortcuts for restrictions on uh, that property, saying that um, some values. Uh, right, it's uh, it's a little bit um, um, other point of view. It is uh, the, the property point of view here. So we have the property and we say that uh, some values uh, from things, so there are some values is what this is saying uh, on this property. And uh, those individuals which have some values on this property are subclass of uh, this particular class. This is again in English saying that whenever uh, something is a member of this class, so whenever something has this property with some value, it belongs to a uh, class which uh, is a domain of that property. Uh, this might be a little bit hard to explain, but when you think about it, it makes sense. So whenever, uh, when you have a property, which has a class as a domain, which means that uh, values uh, subject uh, using this predicate are from this class. 
then it is the same as saying that whenever something has some value on this property, it belongs to this, uh, this class. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, it is a little bit hard to, to explain. You need to think about it on your own, but uh, it just makes sense. Uh, and the same goes for the range. It is the other way around. It uh, is the combination of the subclass of construct and the our thing uh, construct and the restriction construct. So all these, when you combine them together, you get the RDF as domain and RDF as range definitions. Um, yeah, so it is just a description of the effect that whenever you have a property or a predicate which has a domain and a range defined in your vocabulary, whenever you use it, the subjects automatically are considered instances of uh, the domain class and the, the objects are automatically considered instances of the uh, range class. Right, and uh, I'll introduce a simple modeling example using all those constructs. So we may want, we will define some predicates and uh, classes in a way not possible just by using RDFS. So we'll define a class healthy and we'll say that healthy is a subclass of complement of dead. So this is saying that healthy beings are not dead. Well, that makes sense, right? So uh, starting from the right, we'll take the complement of dead, which is uh, living, and we'll say that healthy beings are subclass of living beings. Makes sense, right? So then we'll define cat and we'll say that cat is a subclass of union of dead and alive. So we'll say that every cat is either dead or alive. Um, then uh, we'll say that uh, when someone owns something, they care for it. So uh, the predicate owns connecting someone to the thing they own is a subproperty of the predicate connecting someone to things they care for. So whenever someone owns something, they care for it. And uh, that's the subproperty of relation here. And uh, finally, we'll define a class happy cat owner. So happy, happy cat owner is a subclass of, and uh, now we'll have an intersection of two restrictions. This restriction says that they uh, have some values from the cat class uh, connected using the owns predicate. They own a cat. And this one is that uh, all values from um, all values from this cares for property are members of healthy, which means that all beings they care for are healthy. They own a cat, therefore they care for the cat, and the cat is healthy because um, they are and they are happy, <laughs> which is this part. So a happy cat owner owns a cat and all beings uh, they care for are healthy. This is the part saying that all beings they care for are healthy. This is the part saying they own a cat. And this is the part saying that when they own something, they care for it. So these things together define the happy cat owner class. And we all have an individual Schrodinger uh, of a type happy cat owner. So we have, uh, we have a class definitions, we have predicate definitions, and we have uh, an individual uh, of uh, this type, which is defined in this more complex way than possible using RDFS. Now, just from a technical point of view, technical RDF point of view, what is, what is this definition? Well, if you take a look, those are blank nodes and those are RDF lists. So in fact, we have a happy cat owner, which is this class. It is a subclass of a blank node. And the blank node has a predicate intersection of. And the value here is a list. And the list contains two items, which are blank nodes. And uh, one is of a, both are of a type restriction. One is has the on property owns predicate and the some values from cat predicate. And, uh, and so on. So this is the technical representation, the graph representation of this definition. It uses a lot of syntactic sugar 
from RDF turtle, the blank nodes and the RDF list. Uh, so it might uh, be uh, not clear on the first sight what it actually represents, but it represents this in RDF. Right, so using this, we might build our knowledge base. So we'll have some class definitions, some predicate definitions. We'll have some individuals belonging to some of the classes. And uh, why would we do that? Uh, this complex definition of all this? Well, we might want to know uh, answers to, to some questions. For instance, whether the knowledge base is consistent, which means is there any conflict in that knowledge base? Uh, or we might want to know whether the knowledge base entails, which means can we say that Schrodinger is alive based on what we know. If we take a look at what we know, it is not clear whether Schrodinger is alive, whether Schrodinger is a member of the X alive class. We only know that Schrodinger is a happy cat owner. So the question is, based on this knowledge, can we say that Schrodinger is alive? Well, that's something we might want to um, have answered. Uh, we want, might want to see whether a class is satisfiable, which means again, whether um, the intersection of dead and alive is empty uh, or not. We might want to know whether a knowledge base entails a subclass statement. So the question is, is alive subclass of healthy based on the knowledge base that we have? Well, it's not clear. We would need to do some computation, some reasoning on top of the knowledge base to be able to answer those questions. Uh, now, some of those, those problems can be reduced to other problems. And actually, we'll see that uh, most of those problems can be reduced to the question of whether a knowledge base is inconsistent or not. So the class membership, so when the question is whether Schrodinger is alive, can be reduced to uh, the uh, inconsistency question by adding Schrodinger of a type uh, complement of alive into the knowledge base and seeing whether this makes the knowledge base inconsistent. If this makes the knowledge base inconsistent, then the opposite needs to be true and therefore Schrodinger is alive. The satisfiability of something, again, uh, we want to know if the intersection of dead or alive is empty or not. So we'll, we'll say that we want to know whether this is an empty class. So we'll add an individual of this type into the knowledge base. When this makes this knowledge base inconsistent, then this uh, class was empty. Um, or actually we, we can entail from the knowledge base that it is empty. Uh, and the subclass of, again, uh, if we want to know whether a life is subclass of healthy, let's say that we'll um, add an individual um, of the type intersection of alive and complement of healthy, which would be a conflict uh, with this statement. And if it makes the knowledge base inconsistent, then this statement uh, was true based on the knowledge we had. So all these um, can be reduced into the question whether a knowledge base is consistent or not. And uh, the, the checking of the consistency of the knowledge base, again, uses techniques from logic and, uh, and so on. And uh, I will just illustrate one of the techniques called Tableau. Um, and uh, yeah, just a quick illustration of how that can be used to see whether a knowledge base is consistent or not. So it is a bit simplified, but uh, you, I think you'll get the, uh, the, the gist of it. So let's have our knowledge base like this. Uh, this is what we have already seen in uh, the example. So we'll have the class healthy, which is subclass of complement of dead. We'll have cat, which is um, either dead or alive. We'll have the predicate owns, uh, which is subproperty of cares form, and we'll have the happy cat owner, and we'll have Schrodinger of a type happy cat owner. And uh, we just want to check whether this knowledge base is consistent, um, whether there is a, 
Actually, actually, I think we might want to know whether the cat is alive or dead in this case. Um, so let's see uh, whether the cat is dead or alive. And uh, we'll start from the bottom. So we know that Schrodinger is a happy cat owner and let's see what it actually means to be a happy cat owner. Well, it means that Schrodinger is a member of the green class here and the blue class here because he's a member of the intersection, he's a member of both of them. Uh, so Schrodinger, happy cat owner, uh, Schrodinger is member of the blue and the green class. So a cat owner and uh, a happy person because all the beings he cares for are healthy. Um, because he's a member of the intersection, he's a member of both of those. Um, well, being a member of the green class means that uh, he has this value, owns, and uh, some values from uh, on this property are cats. So he owns a cat. That's um, uh, what the knowledge base entails. <clears throat> right. Then, uh, because he owns the cat, he also cares for the cat. That's from this statement. We already know that he owns the cat, and owns is a property of cares for, which means that he cares for the cat. Now, we know that the cat is, is healthy because uh, we know that from um, his uh, membership of the blue class, because he, uh, all, the, all the beings he cares for are from the healthy uh, class. So the cat is also, also healthy. Now, being a cat means being dead or alive. Uh, it is a union, so we don't know whether the cat is dead or alive. We just know that it is dead or alive. So this gives us two options. Either the cat is uh, healthy and dead, or the cat is healthy and alive. Well, being healthy also means being a member of a complement of dead. And therefore, uh, the cat cannot be dead and member of complement of dead. This is a conflict and this cannot be the case. Therefore, the cat is uh, alive and uh, this knowledge base is satisfiable. So uh, it is consistent. And uh, this is how an algorithm might solve the question of uh, satisfiability of some class or uh, in, uh, consistency of, of some knowledge base. Right, so this was an introduction to ALO. It is just an introduction. All those um, constructs are there in our, but there are also many more and we might combine them and so on. And these are the problems that our then allows you to solve using a software called a reasoner, which implements our and allows you to check for consistency of your knowledge base, which is defined using our like this. Um, right, any questions regarding our? Owl is not part of the semester project. So this is just information that it exists and it allows you to model um, semantically model uh, some domain in a more complex way than just saying we have some classes and some properties like we are able to do with RDFS. Right, if there are no more questions, then that's all for today and I'll see you again next week.